Lot Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the ninth day of the eighth month, which happens to line up with the 19th of October, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're continuing with our reading of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, as they're called. So far, we've gone through the Testament of Yahusuf, the first of the 12 to pass away at 110. Then we read the Testament of Shimon, who died the year of, and then Reuben, who died two years after the death of Yahusuf. The third in order here, dying at 114 years of age, would have been Zebulun, who also died two years after the death of Yahusuf, it says. However, when you add up the dates, just to be perfectly candid here, when you look at the dates that we have in the book of Yobelim or Jubilees for the births of the 12 patriarchs there, and you add up how long it says they lived and when they should have died, the dates aren't always lining up exactly. This says that it was two years after the death of Yahusuf. And if I remember correctly, I'll look at it real quick. It said that Yahusuf in the book of Yobelim died in 2244 Aniomundi, or from creation. Then it says that Zebulun here. If I can find it, there we go. It says that he died in 2248. So that's actually four years after instead of two years after. But the text here says two. So whether he was not born when it says or he died at a different date, there's some discrepancies there. There's also a few more lined up with the death of some of these patriarchs and when they were actually brought into the land of Canaan to bury them. I don't have all the answers for you, but generally, this is the order that they died in, and that's what I'm trying to cover. Father willing, we can have more clarity on these things as we're able to discover them, but for right now, this is the best that we have. Not adding to, not taking away, not just making stuff up. Just going with what we have and being honest about our ignorance and deficiencies. Okay? <clears throat> but it says, The copy of the, test, or the words of Zebulun, which he enjoined on his sons before he died in the 114th year of his life, two years after the death of Yahusuf. And he said to them, Hearken to me, you sons of Zebulun. <clears throat> Attend to the words of your father. I, Zebulun, was born a tov gift to my parents. For when I was born, my father was increased very exceedingly, both in flocks and herds, when with the staked rods, or straked rods, he had his portion. We were, we just read this not too long ago about how he would take and put the rods before those that were herding together. If you remember, we looked into the words that were used in the Hebrew and what they meant. But the ones that flocked together, he had to propagate to be spotted, speckled, and striped to be his. And the ones that didn't flock together, he would not put the rods down, and they would be the portion for Laban. <clears throat> but it says, I am not conscious that I have sinned all my days save in thought. Nor yet do I remember that I have done any inequity except the sin of ignorance which I committed against Yahusuf. For I coveted it, or covenanted it with my brethren not to tell my father what had been done. And that was the sin of ignorance. Now, people might contest that he knew what he was doing. He was still, you know, a young, he wasn't a man at the time. But his brothers were older. He had Yahusuf try to hide behind him, but yet he still coveted, covenanted, rather, with his brethren not to say anything on pain of death, right, through fear. And that's the sin of ignorance that he committed. 
ignorance because if he really knew the truth, he would have stood on it and not made that alignment and done things that were wrong in any capacity. Just like every man who ever does anything wrong, it's because they're ignorant of the future judgment. They might know of it, but they're not really fearing or believing. If there's true belief, there's true fear. And if there's true fear, you will not do what will cause you to be put there, period. It is that simple. Except the sin of ignorance which I committed against Yahusuf, for I covenanted with my brethren not to tell my father what had been done. But I wept in secret many days on account of Yahusuf, for I feared my brethren, because they had all agreed that if anyone should declare the secret, he should be slain. But when they desired to kill him, I adjured them much with tears not to be guilty of this sin. For Shimon and Gad came against Yahusuf to kill him, and he said unto them with tears, Pity me, my brethren, have mercy upon the bowels of Jacob our father. Lay not upon me your hands to shed innocent blood, for I have not sinned against you. And if indeed I have sinned with chastening, chastise me, my brethren, but lay not upon me your hand for the sake of Jacob our father. And as he spoke these words, wailing as he did so, I was unable to bear his lamentations and began to weep. And this is just a testament that there's nothing wrong with a man crying. It, it's a sign of character that you actually have a conscience, that you have a heart, that you care if you cry in these types of situations, that you commiserate with those who mourn, right? That you have compassion. It says, my liver was poured out and all the substance of my bowels was loosened. And I wept with Yahusuf and my heart sounded and the joints of my body trembled and I was not able to stand. And when Yahusuf saw me weeping with him, and them coming against him to slay him, he fled behind me, beseeching them. But meanwhile Reuben rose up and said, Come, my brethren, let us not slay him, but let us cast him into one of these dry pits, which our fathers digged and found no water. For for this cause Yahuwah forbade that water should rise up in them. So you see, the, the wells that were dug by their fathers were unprofitable, not, not to curse him. He didn't waste his labors for no purpose, but because, but in order that Yahusuf should be preserved. And they did so until they sold him to the Yishmaelim. Okay. Now, right here, this is a key to some, some of European history. The things that are going on with Yahusuf, what we'd call the, the reformers of Germany and England, if you will, the, the sons of Yahusuf, Ephraim and Manasseh, both literally and the spiritual because of those sojourning with them, okay? Not everyone in the land of Britain or in America, for example, is the literal seed of Ephraim and Manasseh, respectively. That's just not true. You have those of Yahuda, those of Shimon, possibly, and of Louis, all dwelling at least with them, not to mention potentially those of the other literal tribe members of the literal tribes of the seed of Abraham. But you're called by the tribe that you sojourn with. So those that are of Yahuda that rule over them are still called of Yahusuf, even though it, like the monarchy in England, if you will, are from the seed of Zerah, or the seed of, yeah, Zerah of Yahuda with the Ferez line or the line of Dawid married into it. All of these things are foretold and talked about in other places that we've covered before, so I don't want to get into that too much right now. But my point is I'm trying to to show you how these things can be seen in history playing out in their children in a larger scale. 
So you have when Yahusuf was being persecuted, when he, when Shimon and Gad, which would be like Spain, if you will, South America and Spain, when they were persecuting the brethren, it was France, Reuben, who rose up and said not to kill him, but to cast him in. And then it was Yahuda, the kinsman redeemer, who sold him, right? And then later on was re redeeming, right? The redemption for what he had done. That's a key thing to keep in mind, okay? But let's continue. It says, and, and they did so until they sold him to the Yishmaelim. For in his price I had no share, my children. But Shimon and Gad and six other of our brethren took the price of Yahusuf and bought sandals for themselves. This is the a Middle Eastern custom with sandals. This is where it comes from, okay? Both in the land here with the children that you see in the, the scriptures and the customs of the Middle Easterners generally with shoes, right? But, and they bought sandals for themselves and their wives and their children saying we will not eat of it for it is the price of our brother's blood but we will assuredly tread it underfoot because he said that he would be king over us and so let us see what will become of his dreams now remember he was openly probably a little ignorantly just open about the dreams that he had and his brothers knew the what it meant and were jealous of him. You see that playing out um, in the other children that have dreams and visions and they don't say anything to their brethren, right? They keep it to themselves. <clears throat> this is, therefore, it is written in the writing of the law or Torah of Moshe that whosoever will not raise up seed to his brother his sandal should be unloosed and they should spit in his face or into his face. That's where that custom came from right here. And the brethren of Yahusuf desired not that their brother should live and Yahuwah loosened from them the sandal which they wore against Yahusuf their brother. For when they came into Egypt or Mitzrayim, <clears throat> which... If you remember in the book called The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, he goes over the etymology of these words. Not only is Mizraim or Mitzrayim the name of the son of Ham, but it also means in Hebrew, the constrainer of the waters, which is what Mitzrayim did in the land where he constrained the Nile until the delta by building it up at certain places and having it it's been watched till this day right but he constrained the waters to allow that place to be cultivated and to have the the cities built the way they were and then thus it was named after him but either way it says for when they came into egypt for they were unloosed by the servants of yahusuf outside the gate and so they made obscience or worship to Yahusuf after the fashion of King Pharaoh. Right. Just like it mentions in the book of Yobelim, the first founding of things and why it's instituted, this is continuing the trend in inspired writings, most likely when this was retranslated or re-given by Ezra and the scribes. That's why you have these types of therefore it is written, right? It's giving you the explanation. Just like you have that in the book of Yobelim, therefore it is written, right? But either way, it says, therefore it is written in the in the Torah of Moshe that whosoever will not raise up seed to his brother, his sandals should be unloosed and they should spit into his face. And that's why you see, no, I'm not only to keep doing that, but there's all these illusions and these parables. Everything in scripture explains other things that you see. And in the the Psalms, where you have it says, Moab is my wash pot over Edom, I throw my shoe. Right? 
that, that doesn't really have any meaning to people. It just sounds like flowery song language, but you realize that the context here is because he would not raise up seed unto his brother, and Yahusuf rose up to persecute Yaakov and his children and to wipe them out. He wanted to attack the seed, and that was a foreshadow of things to come with Rome. Then all these things start making more sense, and you're like, ah, now you get the context, right? But that's why he's saying he speaks in parables. Everything that he does is a parable, and to his people, his children, that come to him for the explanation, he reveals these things. This is, in the brethren of Yahusuf desired not that their brother should live, and Yahuwah loosed from them the sandal which they wore against Yahusuf, their brother. For when they came into Egypt, they were unloosed by the servants of Yahusuf outside the gate. I already read this part, sorry. And so they made obscience, or worship, to Yahusuf after the fashion of King Pharaoh. And not only did they make obscience, or worship, to him, but were spit upon also, falling down before him forthwith. And so they were put to shame before the Egyptians. For after this the Mitraim, or Egyptians, heard all the evils, that they had done to Yahusuf. This is, and after they had cast him into the pit, my brethren sat down to eat, for through two days, or for I, sorry, through two days, and two nights ate nothing through pity of Yahusuf, and Yahuda ate not with them, but watched the pit. For he feared lest Shimon and Gad should run off and slay him. We'll look at the other one too, just to see the differences, okay? And when they saw that I also ate not, they set me to watch him until he was sold. And he spent in the pit three days and three nights, and so was sold, famishing. And when Reuben heard that while he was away, Yahusuf had been sold, he rent his clothes and mourned, saying, How shall I look in the face of Yaakov, my father? And he took the money and ran after the merchants and found no one, for they had left the main road and journeyed through the troglodytes by a short cut. The troglodytes means cave dwellers. And that was the uh, sons of Keturah, as mentioned by um, Josephus, right? But really quickly, we'll look at this version here because it, it, it's a little more accurate in what happened with who he is sold to. This is, and after he was sold, my brothers sat down to eat and drink, but I, through pity for Yahusuf, did not eat, but watched the pit, since Yahuda feared lest Shimon, Dan, and Gad should ru rush off and slay him. And those are the ones that are generally added there. I also want to mention, if you pay attention to the infighting between the mothers and who was born when and how they were born, the firstborn not giving the prominence, but the second one generally being accepted with the good news, you'll find interesting parallels with the the children of the handmaidens and who's here and what's being mentioned. But it says, but when they saw that I did not eat, they set me to watch him till he was sold to the Yishmaelim. And when Reuben came and heard that while he was away, Yahusuf had been sold, he rent his garments and morning said, How shall I look on the face of ya of my father, Yaakob? And he took the money and ran after the merchants. But as he fi failed to find them, he returned grieving. But the merchants had left the broad road and marched through the troglodytes sorry, by a shortcut. It says, But Reuben was grieved, and ate no food that day. Dan, therefore, came to him and said, 
weep not, neither grieve, for we have found what we can say to our father Jacob. Let us slay a kid of the goats, and dip it in the coat of Yahusuf, and let us send it to Jacob, saying, No, is this the coat of your son? And they did so, for they stripped off from Yahusuf his coat when they were selling him, and put upon him the garment of a slave. Now Shimon took the coat and would not give it up, for he desired to rend it with his sword. As he was angry that Yahusuf lived and that he had not slain him. Then we all rose up and said unto him, If you give not up the coat, we will say to our father that you alone did this evil thing in Yisrael. And so he gave it unto them, and they did even as Dan had said. <clears throat> now, the suggestion coming from Dan and Dan being a part of those conspiring against him, that is even covered all the way into the renewed covenant times. If any of you have the inclination to look, there is a writing called the Trustees on Antichrist. And I believe there's also mention of it in what is called the, what is it, the refutation of all heresies. Both of these are writings by a gentleman named Hippolytus. He was the taught one of Irenaeus. He was an overseer in Rome, not the city of Rome, but in Italy on, uh, I believe it's on the coast or on an island there. He, he was a bishop, if you will. And he was the taught one of Irenaeus, who was the taught one of Polycarp, who was the taught one of Yahukanon. Irenaeus himself became the overseer of Lyon, or an assembly in France or Gaul at the time. These were where the Hebrews were, that they were being overseers over them to teach them the instructions of the good news, if you will. But Hippolytus writes about the trustees on Antichrist, and he makes the connection between the entire tribe of Dan and their type of the Antichrist in them, and how he, he would come through them, like what we can see with Roman, Irish Roman Catholics today, where Dan is from Ireland, and I'm not exactly sure about the connection with Denmark, to be perfectly honest. I don't know if it it's always it has to be tied in with all of them or just a branch. So, but generally it's known that the uh, Southern Ireland or Ireland itself, other than the Northern part, which was the kingdom of Ulster from Yahuda, you had that as Dan. And then also Denmark was the, the tribe of the, the men of Dan or the land of Dan. But either way, <clears throat> it says, and now... My children, I bid you to keep the commands of Yahuwah and to show mercy to your neighbors and to have compassion towards all, not towards men only, but also towards beasts. For for this thing's sake, Yahuwah Baruch or blessed me. And when all my brethren were sick, I escaped without sickness. I've, I've had this phenomenon myself too. It mentions very distinctly that if you are obedient to his will, he will bring on you none of the diseases that he brought on the Egyptians and they suffered the common ailments that men do today. It mentions that if you keep Passover, if you keep his feasts, he won't, he will keep sickness from you. And we've been we, my family is a testament to that. We've been trying to be obedient and we've been generally without what you'd call the seasonal flus for, for a while. When we do things that are wrong, we do get corrected with chastisements in this way. And that's how I, I became very cognizant to the truth that he says in his word in this regard. But here's another witness to Zebulun. And you'll also see this in the testaments of the different patriarchs. Some of them die in perfect health. Some of them die in sickness. All of them for purposes, both for his purpose and showing the things that will come in the future, if you will, just like Yitzhak and Yaakov were blind in their old age, not because of anything necessarily they were overtly doing, but as signs of what would be in the future, right? 
but all of it ties in with how we've lived our lives as well. So there, we can't escape the things that we have in store for us, but we can learn to not complain about the things that happen and to live according to his will and so be eternally delivered from the wrath to come, right? But he says, I escaped without sickness for Yahuwah knows the purposes of each. Have therefore compassion in your hearts, my children, because even as a man does to his neighbor, even so also will Yahuwah do to him. For the sons of my brethren were sickening and were dying on account of Yahusuf, because they showed not mercy in their hearts. And we'll read about it a little bit here, but Dan lost all of his children but one, right? The 75 that went into Egypt, five died, right? He only had 70 to continue, but only one of his children passed on the, his line. Either way, it says, And when I was in the land of Canaan, or sorry, here's the key here. It says, But my sons were preserved without sickness, as you know. Okay. It says, and when I was in the land of Canaan, by the sea coast, I made a catch of fish for Jacob, my father. And when many were choked in the sea, I continued unhurt. I was the first to make a boat to sail upon the sea, for Yahuwah gave me comprehension and hokma or wisdom therein. And I let down a rudder behind it, and I stretched a sail upon another upright piece of wood in the midst. And I sailed therein along the shores, catching fish for the house of my father, until we came to Egypt, or Mitzrayim. And through compassion I shared my catch with every stranger. And if a man were a stranger or sick, or aged, I boiled the fish and dressed them well, and offered them to all men, as every man had need, grieving with and having compassion upon them. Wherefore also Yahuwah satisfied me with abundance of fish when catching fish. For he that shares with his neighbor receives many fold more from Yahuwah. Which goes right in line with what the shepherd of Hermas says, that those that are rich are given that to be beneficent to others, to benefit those that are not, right? For five years I caught fish and gave thereof to every man whom I saw, and suffice for all the house of my father. Sorry, sufficed. And in the summer I caught fish, and in the winter I kept sheep with my brethren. Now I will declare unto you what I did. I saw man in distress through nakedness in winter time, and had compassion upon him, and stole away a garment secretly from my father's house and gave it to him who was in distress. Do you, therefore, so he gave without his right hand knowing what his, what his left hand was doing. He didn't make a scene or tell anybody. He's mentioning in his deathbed to his own children the things that he did so that they can copy that kind of example, right? Do you, therefore, my children, from that which Elohim bestowed upon you, show compassion and mercy without hesitation to all men, and give to every man with a good heart? And if you have not the with wherewithal to give to him that needs, have compassion for him in bowels of mercy. This is, you can be commiserating with him. You can't feel bad if you don't have the means to help. You do with what you can. But at the very least, you can be compassionate, right? <clears throat> Even if people are suffering for their own choices that they've made, you can be compassionate. It says, I know that my hand found not the wherewithal to give to him that needed, and I walked with him, weeping for seven furlongs, and my bowels yearned towards him in compassion. Have therefore 
yourselves also, my children, compassion towards every man with mercy or with loving kindness. The, the word in Hebrew is chesed. Bill Barrick from the 501 Hebrew grammar class online, the master seminary course that you can do for free, he translates the word chesed as covenant love, right? But with compassion towards every man with mercy, that Yahuwah also may have compassion and mercy upon you. Because also in the last days, Elohim will send his compassion on the earth, and wheresoever he finds bowels of mercy, he dwells in him. For in the degree in which a man has compassion upon his neighbors, in the same degree has Yahuwah also upon him. Meaning you reap what you sow, right? And when we went down into Egypt, Yahusuf bore no malice against us. To whom taking heed do you also, my children, approve yourselves without malice, and love one another, and do not set down an account, or in account each one of you, evil against his brother. For this breaks unity, and divides all kindred, and troubles the inner being, and wears away the countenance. So, don't hold a grudge, right? Yahusuf never attributed wrongdoing to his brethren, didn't hold a grudge against them, didn't, didn't think about it that way. And he had joy in his life. He was successful in what he was doing. Yahuwah corrected his enemies for him, right? All the things that are in his word about what to do and how we don't revenge ourselves but let him do it, you can see play out in these children who actually did the thing. And that is, that's for our benefit, for us to literally do the thing too and get the same kind of benefit from the Almighty because this is how reality works. Observe, therefore, the waters and know when they flow together. Here's one of the first references to men being equated to waters. Okay. <clears throat> They sweep along stones, trees, earth, and other things. But if they are divided into many streams, the earth swallows them up, and they become of no account. So shall you also be if you be divided. Be not you therefore divided into two heads, for everything which Yahuwah has made has but one head, and two shoulders, two hands, two feet, but all the remaining members. For I have learnt in the writing of my fathers that you shall be divided in Israel, and you shall follow two kings, the northern and southern kingdom, right? And shall work every abomination, and your enemies shall lead you captive. Deuteronomy, the, one of the last things Moshe says is, Beware, your enemies shall deceive you, shall try to deceive you, and you shall tread upon their high places. I mean, you're going to keep their their, uh, their ways of worship right there. It says, And you shall be evil entreated among the nations with many infirmities and tribulations. <clears throat> and after these things, you shall remember Yahuwah and repent. And he shall have mercy upon you, for he is merciful and compassionate. And he sees not down, or sets not down, in account evil against the sons of men, because they are flesh and are deceived through their own wicked deeds. It says, And after these things shall there arise unto you Yahuwah himself, the light of righteousness. And then it goes on right here, but there's a missing part here. So we're going to go ahead and finish this one, and then we'll read the other one. It says, And you shall return unto your own land, and you shall see him in Yerushalayim for his name's sake. All right. The reason why these are broken up the way they are is because these are different manuscripts, different translations of the, of the text that were found that have different versions. Some of them missing sections that are in others. And if you look and see, you'll see why. 
It says, And after these things you shall remember Yahuwah and repent, and he shall cause you to return, for he is merciful and compassionate. And he sets down not an in account evil to the sons of men, because they are flesh. And the Ruach oath, or spirits of deceit, deceive them in all their deeds. Which is exactly what is given in Yobelim and other places, right? And after these things there shall arise unto you, Yahuwah himself, the light of righteousness, and healing and compassion shall be in his wings. He shall redeem all the captivity of the sons of men from worthlessness, or Belial, and every spirit of deceit shall be trodden down. And he shall bring back all the nations into the zeal for him, which We'll get into more of this later as we get more towards the times of the redemption and good news is a parable, but you can see it here. Our Mashiach says he only says what he hears, only see, does what he sees, and at, and it, he does that from the beginning. We've mentioned this. There's a picture like a hand in a glove, hand in a glove thing, and you can see that he, through the creation account, he's showing all the things that will happen, and then he reiterates like an echo as the Father used him to make all things, in that second week after creation, he talks with Adam to name all the creatures. And it's a type of hand in glove, hand in glove, only doing what he sees kind of pattern. He does the same thing when he comes down to deliver the children, and he sends a deliverer in Moshe, the one who comes like unto him, to the children. So there's different patterns like that, but here's a <clears throat> here's another one for you. He is the Elohim of all flesh, and when men went apostate, he left his, his sheep to go after the lost ones. His sheep were given over for his son, to, to, which was all creation, right? While well, he's studiously going for the lost sheep, if you will. And as our Mashiach is over all his creation, and he's given, and he's given to be over his people specifically, when they went apostate, he has over his righteous people, the remnant that has not gone apostate, Mikael, the one who is like El, while he himself, the shepherd, has gone to save the 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 one that is in uh went astray. So it's that same picture here. And the whole purpose is for the deliverance of all the Gentiles or all nations. When he came and physically delivered the the physical literal seed of Abraham out of Egypt. That was a type of his coming physically in the flesh to deliver the true seed out of spiritual bondage, right? And it's the literal seed of Abraham and all those that join with them or sojourning with them. But it's open to all the nations, which was the secret that was made manifest after he came, okay? But even foretold right here, although not in every version, it says, and you shall see Elohim in the fashion of a man, which Yahuwah shall, or in the place which Yahuwah shall choose, Yarushalayim, or he will come down in Shalom, is its name. And uh, Yarod is he will come down, not Yaru directly, but Shalom is peace. And they, um, they have uh, different meanings for that one. <clears throat> then continuing, it says, And again, through the wickedness of your works, shall you provoke him to anger, and you shall be cast away by him unto the time of consummation. The time of consummation mentioned in Baruch is the beginning, it's the millennial reign, where it's the beginning of the forever after, but it's not the culmination of it. It says, And now... My children, grieve not that I am dying, nor be cast down in that I am coming to my end. For I shall rise again in the midst of you as a ruler in the midst of his sons. And I shall rejoice in the midst of my tribe as many as shall keep the law of Yahuwah and the commandments of Zebulun their father. But upon the unrighteous shall Yahuwah bring eternal fire, 
and destroy them throughout all generations. But I am now hastening away to my rest, as did also my fathers. But do you fear Yahuwah, our Elohim, with all your strength, all the days of your life? And when he had said these things, he fell asleep at a tove old age, and his sons laid him in a wooden coffin. And afterwards they carried him up and buried him in Hebron with his fathers. It does not mention that they buried him with his fathers when they carried up all the other children, or that it was during the time where the, there was a blockade. So I'm, and because of the timing there, I believe that this is some of them were taken and buried beforehand, and some of them had they had to wait and take them all up together. And then there was a time that they couldn't go back and forth between the lands. So I don't have all of that down pat chronologically yet. I don't know if we're able to, but Father willing, we'll, we'll get it as clear as we can. However, that is the testament of Zebulun there. And that might be it for now. So we'll, we'll wrap things up. Hold on a moment. All right, so next week, because we, we're uh, running out on time for now, next week when we come together, Father willing, we will continue with the reading of the Testament of Yahuda, the fourth son of Jacob, who died in presumably the same year as Zebulun there at 119. But until then, and also when we get there, there's a lot more in his you see a lot more with what will happen with the monarchies of the world and the things that will go on with the rulers and leadership. Something that was foreshadowed that you can still see the um, evidence of in the book of First Enoch or Hanok that we have, although that is not the complete writings of what it was originally. You can still see that. And then in here, he makes some pretty amazing allusions to the monarchs, um, being like sea monsters or dragons, beasts in the earth, right? And the people being swallowed up in the sea by them. However, right, that's for next time. Thank you all for fellowship today. May you have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and a great week ahead of Shavuot Tov. We will see you next time. Shalom.